Your teachings are quite confusing. <laughs> yeah, that makes me laugh. <laughs> In the scripture, mm -hmm. it says that there will be a second coming and Jesus will return to earth. Mm -hmm. During this time, the sky will turn red. I know that this is metaphorically speaking, but honestly, you being Jesus rejects a lot of statements in the book of Revelations, mm. doesn't it? Mm, it does. It definitely rejects a lot of statements in the book of Revelation. Firstly, the verse that the person is referring to is in Acts 2, and it's a quote from the book of Joel, which it says, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood. So it doesn't actually say sun to red. The sun's already red or yellowish red. <laughs> the sky, the sky. This yeah, the sky it yeah. doesn't say yeah. that in this verse. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. Now, now this verse was being used by the Apostle Peter for a start. Mm -hmm. In context, it was being used. Peter used it to explain what was happening at Peter's day right at that time. He was, he was saying... Jesus, the Messiah, have al has already come and gone, uh -huh. right? And what we're doing now, which is sharing the truth to you in your own language, performing these signs of the Holy Spirit, this is proof that he's come and gone. Yes, right? I see. And this was foretold by the prophet Joel. So in context of what he was saying, he was quoting these verses, not related to some time now in our modern age, but rather some about his day 2,000 years ago. That's the context. Okay. of what the verse is being used in. So, so pulling it out of that context and applying it to another context is like a person, again, making some fairly great leaps in terms of the interpretation of their Bible. The context is Peter was applying it to what he was doing in his day, demonstrating through the gifts of the Spirit, as he, he called them, the, uh, the truth of the prophecy of Joel. Mm -hmm. That's the main purpose. Mm -hmm. And proof that I had come to the earth already. So that's what he was using it for. Proof right. that I had already come. So that, that's the underlying purpose of the verse. Um, and again, I find a lot of Christians want to apply, they make these great leaps of verses into the modern era, mostly because they've been taught by their own ministers that there is this connection between the first century time period and the modern era. And, and so they feel that, that many verses in the Bible can be applied over and over again to different time periods. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, uh, and, and sometimes it is the case, then it means that it's very open to interpretation, which it is. Now, this pro the problem is that it's basically saying, well, the, the, the person in this question is basically saying, because I haven't come in the way the Bible describes, then I can't be Jesus. Yes. And also this person is saying that they're also saying it's a metaphorical statement about the sky turning red or the moon turning red. Yep. So Which is an interpretation as well, isn't it? Which is it? an interpretation in itself. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I agree that it is a metaphorical statement, right. but that is an interpretation. Yeah. And, and therefore a supposition. Yeah. Like the Bible doesn't say, oh, with regard to this verse, it's, you need to interpret as a metaphorical verse. Yeah. The Bible doesn't give instructions to its interpretation. Uh-huh. So, so there's nowhere in the Bible that says, interpret this as metaphorical, interpret this as literal, interpret this as something else. Yeah. yeah. Or something to do with your future spirit life or something. Yeah. Like, it doesn't give these kind of instructions. And, and I understand why it doesn't, because it, it would mean it would be three times as thick <laughs> <laughs> if it gave such instructions. But, but, but unfortunately, this is why there are so many Christian denominations, because every Christian denomination interprets every one of these verses differently, generally. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they then come up with their own suppositions. And then, of course, they condemn me for saying that I'm Jesus because I don't match their supposition. I don't match even their supposition of what Jesus would do. Mind you, the Jesus of the Bible is a lot crueler and a lot more difficult a person than I am currently. So, so, but I don't match him, of course. So therefore, they say, ah. Oh, you know, he can't be Jesus. Mind you, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that portray my character accurately and are exactly the same as my character now, but they don't use those to say, well, maybe he is Jesus because they want to believe that I will come in a certain specific way. Now, my suggestion to people who want to believe the Bible is God's word, it is your right to believe the Bible is God's word 
and to believe that you shouldn't listen to anything else. That is your right because you have been given free will. You're able to make that choice and decision. I would like to share with you what I have observed over 2,000 years of people making this decision. I have observed huge amounts of trauma for people who make this decision to believe that all of the Bible is God's word. I've observed trauma in their day-to-day life on earth before they pass because they do not understand the truth of God's universe and how it works and how it impacts upon their own life. They do not understand how their choices and decisions have affected their soul condition as a result of believing some of the words of the Bible. As a result of that, when they pass into the spirit world, they've passed with a lot of trauma and a lot of difficulty in coming to understand the truth about the universe and about God. In fact, many Christians who have passed forget God altogether after they pass because they are so disillusioned with what the Bible taught them. The Bible taught them untruth, but they assumed it to be true And then when they found out that it was not true, they then discard not only the Bible, but any concept of God or any concept of love. And I've seen many Christians live in many years of torment in the spirit world as a result of them throwing away the baby with the bathwater, as the saying goes, the the truth that's contained within with the false things that are contained within. In addition, I've seen many people in the spirit world who are Christian because of their false beliefs about the devil their false beliefs about hell, their false beliefs that they can't get out of a condition once they've gotten into a certain condition, their false beliefs about my sacrifice, their false beliefs on what saves them, have all impacted for many long years their life in the spirit world. You've observed it as well, I know, Mm -hmm. darling. And, And so as a result of these observations, we can tell you categorically that if you choose to accept the Bible as God's word without any critical analysis, you are going to not only be severely disappointed in your future life, but you are also going to have a lot of difficulties in your future life unravelling the untruth that you've imbibed in your life as a result of believing that it's God's word. My suggestion is to do something completely different. My suggestion is to, to start with a clean slate in your belief systems for a change and analyse everything from logic, from truth and from love and particularly from logic and love. You don't know what the truth is yet. Assume you don't know what the truth is yet rather than believing that what the Bible says is true. And then what you do is you look at it logically and look at it from a perspective of love. Now, if there's things in the Bible that portray things that are unloving about God, get rid of them. They are not a part of God's nature. They are not a part of your your future even if if you don't want it to be. If there's anything that's out of harmony with logic in in a normal logical situation, discount them or at least temporarily discount them, assuming that you have not enough logic yet to determine what the truth is, rather than just accepting them by faith, as you call it. Faith is established not through a lack of logic or mystery. Faith is established through something actually happening. This is very important to understand Mm -hmm for, I believe, every single person on the planet. Faith can only be established with, from what you know, and what you know can only be established through personal experience. It can't be established through anyone else's experience. It can only be established through what actually happened. So, for example, I know, and I have complete faith, that if I jump into the air, then I'm going to return to the ground. Right? Now, why do I know this? This because every single person that I know around me and my own life demonstrates to me that every time I've jumped into the air, I've come back to the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, there is the potential if there was no gravity that if I jumped into the air, I'd fly out into space. But of course, that doesn't happen because of this law of gravity that always pulls me back to the ground. This causes me to have faith that the next time I jump, I'm not going to fly into space. So I don't walk around all afraid that I'm going to jump at some point and fly into space because I know for certain that that can never happen. It's very much the same with your own faith. You can only know something for certain after you've had a personal experience of it. Now, many people who are on earth, most people, in fact, that are on earth, the majority, have never experienced the spirit world. You do not know what's going to happen in it because you've never experienced it. You cannot know until you've been there. Now, you could listen to some people who have been there, but the Bible precludes you from listening to those people. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that you shouldn't speak to a medium who's speaking to a spirit. 
So it actually stops you from listening to such people. So that severely limits your ability to determine truth. My suggestion instead of that is to listen to the people who have actually done something and then if you don't believe it, see how you go, put it in the I don't know basket rather than putting it in the it's definitely not true basket. Right? And in my life, I have three baskets. I have an I don't know basket, I know for certain basket, and it's definitely not true basket. Now, everything goes in the I don't know basket yeah. until, for me, it enters the I know for certain basket or I don't know for certain basket. And my suggestion to every single person who's listening to these FAQs is to go, all right, instead of me thinking that this is God's word without knowing, because I don't know, I, I have no proof, no evidence whatsoever, aside from what it tells me. And even that's flawed. So I have no knowledge whatsoever of whether it's true or not. Instead of doing that, let's put all of that in the I don't know basket. All right? And then analyse things through this critical analysis of logic and love. Firstly, if it's loving, then put it in the probably true basket. If it's unloving, put it in the probably false basket. If, it, if it's uh, illogical, put it in the probably false basket. If it's logical, put it in the probably true basket. And in the end, you will end up with a series of teachings which will be very, very close to what my teachings already are if you want to go through that long-winded process mm -hmm. of determining truth. Or you could just listen to a person such as myself who has been to the spirit world and who has had a connection with God and who does know what he was talking about and, in fact, who was the very founder of your faith, right? You could listen to him if you so chose. But if you're frightened to do that, then do this other thing. Put it in the I don't know basket and determine what is true and what is false through logic and through your reason and through your love. And what about through lived experience? How does you, you're talking about the probabilities, and once we then have an experience of these things, is that when they reach into the certainty basket? Yeah, it's impossible for us. If, if I can give an illustration of that, let's say I said theoretically I could walk through that wall theoretically because my body is made of atoms and the wall's made of atoms, and somehow if I could get my atoms in synchronisation with the wall's atoms, there's a potential that I can walk through the matter of the wall. Mm -hmm. There's that potential. Mm -hmm. If I've never done it, I don't know for certain. It's when I do it that I'll say that's in the true basket. When, it, when I do it, yeah. that's when it's true. When you do it, that's when it's true for you. Right? If it hasn't happened for you, then it's not true yet. And don't assume that just because certain things have happened, it's because of your assumptions. Because mm -hmm. there may be other explanations. Look at all of the possible explanations. A wise person will look at all of the possible explanations as to why they had a certain experience. So many people who are Christian have had an experience of receiving divine love. Don't assume it's because of your belief systems because I know Christians with completely the opposite belief systems of you that have had the same experience. I know people who are not even Christian who have had the same experience. So, so you can't assume that it's based on your beliefs. It's got to be based on something else. And if you look at what was happening at the time, most of the time there was a longing in the soul. There was this desire in the soul to connect to God, connect to truth, you know, and this dispassionate desire in the soul that God's responding to. And, he, and God responds to it no matter what religion we are. No matter what faith or lack of faith we have, yeah. God responds to this desire. Now, we need to have an open mind about these matters before we determine what is truth. Now, a lot of Christians believe that the reason why they've had these experiences is because they believe the Bible is God's word. That's not the reason why. That's the assumption about the reason why, which is very different from a logical perspective than the actual reason. The actual reason is completely different because people who are not believers in the Bible have had the same experiences, mm -hmm. which tells me that there must be something else going on other than just a belief in the Bible. This is, these are the kind of things that need to be considered by the Christian who's sincerely analysing these particular matters. We have seen the results of a person holding fast to a strict set of beliefs, whether it's the Bible, the Koran, a Hindu, some kind of Hindu belief or Buddhist belief, that there is a very similar set of things that go on for them in the spirit world. We've seen the results of this. Our suggestion to you is to not do this, to understand 
that God's word can be written on your heart as long as you understand that God's word is infinite and you'll be continually growing in the truth of it. And you can only do that by entering this relationship with God, which is independent of any book. It's dependent upon the feelings that you have for God, the love you have for God and the love you have for your neighbour. That's what it's dependent upon. And the desire you have for God's love to enter you. That's what it's dependent Mm -hmm. upon. And if you understand that basic truth, you will be able to put the Bible in the I don't know basket until such times as the different things in the Bible, some of which will come to turn out to be true and others of which will turn out to be completely false, you'll find in your future if you do that. But if you go down the track of going, the Bible is God's word, you are going to be severely disappointed in your future and particularly in your spirit life future. You're going to be severely disappointed while you hold on to such beliefs. We have seen the pain that these things cause people and it is very unfortunate that it causes it because there is a lot of truth in the Bible but it is mixed with the error that people have included in the Bible because they wanted their own addictions to be met. And the difficulty is determining determining what is true and what is not. Mm -hmm. If you follow my suggestion that I've just given, you'll be able to work out what is true and what is not rather than just believing that it is God's word completely. Any time you ask me a question stating something in the Bible, my standard response is going to be, but I don't believe the Bible. What other proof do you have? And if you can't give me any other proof, then I'd suggest to you that perhaps it's not God's word because the proof will be in the universe. The universe is of God's creation. The proof will be there if it is God's word. So let's um, look at this from a Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of people on the earth who have been waiting for you to come back for a long time. I agree. And they do all look to this book that you have been holding up Mm -hmm. and talking about applying logic to and all of these things. Mm -hmm. Now, wouldn't it just be easy to fulfil some of those prophecies so all of those people would have more faith or understanding that you are who you say you are? The problem is that many of these prophecies I am forbidden to fulfil if I have a relationship with God that's in love. Mm -hmm. I cannot come and destroy wicked, for example. It's impossible for me to do such a thing and maintain my own uh, connection with God. It's impossible for me to destroy the wicked. I can't do it. So so you're, you're expecting me to do something that's impossible for me to do if you want me to fulfil what the Bible says. It's also, there are many things that, are, uh, that it says I should do in the Bible that, that are not impossible but are highly unlikely in the sense that I don't want to do them. You know, I, I don't want to judge mankind. It's possible that I can judge mankind. You know, I could sit down here and say, yeah, you know, Igor who's behind that camera, He's a bit of a mongrel and he's a bit of this and he's that. Or let's be more polite about it. He's really evil you know, because he did this and that in his life. And I could do all of those kind of things. But why do I need to do such a thing when God's laws already provide any feedback system and corrective system to Igor? I don't need to do such a thing. Mm-hmm. I, I, why would I want to? So the Bible says that I will become a judge or that I am the judge. I don't accept such a thing. I don't want to be a judge and I'm not a judge and God's never offered me judgment because I know God's laws as well as God does on the matter, and that is that God's already set up a system that automatically corrects people without their needing to be a judge. So there's many things that the Bible says I will do that it's impossible for me to do if I love God and if I understand God's love. It's impossible for me to remain at one with God and do them. So so I can't fulfil many of the things the Bible says I should fulfil. And isn't there a parallel? Isn't there a parallel between the Jewish uh, tradition believing in a set of books and waiting for a Messiah to come? Of course. And um, Yeah, what an irony. Like I find this so ironic that here we have in the first century, there were men who, and women who believed in the, in the Jewish Bible of the time, let's call it, what they believed to be God's word, the Torah and the prophets, and they were expecting the Messiah to come and to be a king over the earth 
destroy the wicked, you know, install a righteous government with no end and to have everyone on the earth in subject to him. That's what they were expecting. Now, how different is that to what the Krishnas are expecting at this point in time? Hardly any different at all, with the exception is they believe this entire thing is God's word in comparison to what the Hebrews believe, which is that is God's word, that part of it. That's the only difference. And the, 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 with regard to their expectations of myself, they are identical. That's the irony. The irony is the, the Jews had the expectation that I would be some all-conquering king, warmonger who destroys the wicked and establishes a government. The Christians believe that I'm going to be some all-conquering king who's a warmonger who gets rid of all the wicked and establishes a government. And I never did such a thing when I came the first time, so why do you expect me to do such a thing when I come the second time? Of course I can't. And I can't. It's not that I won't, it's that I can't either. If I want to maintain a relationship with God of love, with love and feel God's love entering my soul all the time as I do, I cannot do such things. It's impossible for me to take such actions. So um, I feel that's the irony of these expectations. The expectations in the first century were based around unloving desires and the expectations now are based around the same unloving desires. Get rid of the unloving desires and analyse things with a, from a more loving perspective and you'll see who the, the real Jesus is. There are many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who claim to be Jesus both on earth and in the spirit world. You'll see who the real one is by his actions, not through any other means. Mm. I have to laugh when people say that my teachings are not logical. It just amuses me. Like how illogical the teachings are of the people who accuse my, me and my teachings of being illogical it just is outstanding. All of my teachings are so logical that a child generally can understand them. We've spoken to children who are five, six years of age and they understand them perfectly, better in fact than most of their parents do in the majority of cases. And so I feel that they are very logical teachings, very straightforward teachings, very easy to understand. The reality is... It's the false teachings the person has already imbibed that prevent them from seeing the simplicity and logic in the teachings that we are presenting. And it's the false teachings that you have to unlearn that cause you so many difficulties with your future life. Mm. Yeah. And you had something to add to the question too. Oh, I just had a... It's more of an aside. Um, because I'm not familiar... Uh, with this person's thinking, saying that uh, the sky will turn red uh, metaphorically. <laughs> what is that a metaphor for? Is that bloodshed or um, change? Well, they or... don't explain that. And they probably uh, don't personally know what right. the metaphor is for. It's sort of like that the way they read it is that it's a metaphor. They'll agree that it's a metaphor. But many of the Christians then feel there has to be some external sign that's really out there and right in your face to show you that Jesus has come. So yeah. the people who do not believe in these particular verses as literal mm -hmm. believe them to be metaphorical, but in, in the metaphor they feel that there has to be some huge outward thing that happens to prove that this person who's claiming to be Jesus is actually Jesus. So they're looking for some kind of miraculous sun, moon, Ominous sky thing, sort of thing. Yep. but, but that, which they view as a metaphor, so they don't actually expect it to happen in the sun, moon or sky, but they, they do sort of expect it to happen in their, it, somehow in their day-to-day -day life without having any real strong definition of what that might be. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I feel, again, uh, a lot of Christian theology is based around supposition and assumption but also based around what people would want to see. It's sort of like feeding them excitement, keeping them excited for the day that Jesus returns mm -hmm. uh, without helping them understand how to determine when Jesus has returned. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you.